yeah, I think that crypto gaming is going to be the biggest consumer market on planet Earth. I think it's going to dwarf industries, even like music, traditional entertainment, uh, modern day gaming. I think it's going to be the biggest of all time. I think that there's a lot of a lot ahead in terms of uh, where people fit into that whole the grand scheme of that beyond just being a YouTuber or a, a Twitch streamer. GM, GM, everyone, and welcome to Art Basel 2022 and this incredible panel about the future of gaming. Now, these guys are going to introduce themselves, but I'm pretty sure they need no introduction. But as we think about the future of gaming, I think it's important to take a quick step back and remember where we came from, the console games of old, when you had to blow on the cartridge to make your game work, and... Gaming was kind of seen as solitary and a little nerdy because console games, you can only have two or four players. I mean, I remember I tried playing Halo with my brother and his friends, and we had to hook up two consoles just to get eight players playing on two TV screens, and that's when it started becoming social. But now you look at gaming today, social is one of the DNA marks of gaming, and it's not nerdy. It is cool. I mean, you guys have seen the FaZe Clan. It is cool. It is entertainment. You can make a career and a living and be famous off of it. So in just a couple of decades, gaming has fundamentally shifted. And today, we're going to talk about where it's going to go. So with that, I'm going to have each of these incredible panelists introduce themselves before we dive into the meet. Betty, why don't you start? Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Betty, founder of Dead Fellas. Hello, I'm John. Hey, guys. Wait, give them like two that. sentences. Give, I know they don't need no introduction, but I want you guys to hero yourselves because the okay. people that are on this stage are game changers of their industry. So brag. Brag, okay. Um, I'm Betty, founder of Dead Fellows, um, protector of creator royalties, <laughs> champion of NFTs, <laughs> queen of Web3, pod mother. <laughs> John. Uh, hi, I'm John Linden. I'm the CEO of Mythical. Uh, been in the game industry a really long time. Originally a studio head at Activision Blizzard on the Call of Duty franchise. So I was not responsible for the uh, Warzone outage yesterday, but uh, yeah, been in that franchise for a long time. So, Lee. Lee. Woo! Hey, I'm uh, Lee Trank, CEO and uh, co-founder of FaZe Clan. I come from a background of traditional entertainment for my whole career. Um, now I've been all, all in on gaming for uh, I don't know five five six years, and uh, excited to just be a part of of how the evolution continues, you know, be of service to kind of to our community, our brand, you know, other other brands in the space, and how thing and how just the brand relationship with the community evolves. Woo! Thanks. I'm Ricky or Faze Banks, all around go. <laughs> um, I started making YouTube videos in 2008, internet kid through and through, uh, founded FaZe Clan with a couple of homies who I met on Xbox Live, and we just went public, and it's crazy. Woo! Thank you. And Kai. Uh, I'm Kai Henry. Um, yeah, I, damn, I don't know how to follow up the overall goat. Um, <laughs> Former chief strategy all around officer. coat. Also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, former chief strategy officer of Phase Clan. Um, I started my career uh, in the music industry, entertainment. Um, just graduated from that early 2000s. Started a you know lifestyle content company called Ski TV, and then got into lifestyle brands and consumer electronics, and just kind of educated myself in every aspect of the lifestyle businesses until I got the Phase Clan and got the pleasure to work with both these gentlemen here. Um, and so, yeah, gaming was kind of the last, the last education uh, realm for me, and uh, and I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of that. So I'm happy to be up here. Woo! And uh, just quick check on AV. Can you guys hear us? Okay, it's a pretty big room. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Dope. All right. So Lee, I want to start with you because you're no stranger to creating new markets, and we're talking future of gaming. You helped bring gaming into entertainment. Right? And there's no doubt it's entertainment, right? In one quarter this year, it's 46 million hours watched of phase streams. They have 8.6 million subs. Peacock only has 13 million, so you're going to eat their lunch. And over a billion views. That's not pro gaming. That's entertainment. So talk to us a little bit about that journey, but also what you learned from that that's going to help us go into the future of gaming. So... 
you know, look, I, I think what what Banks and and the other guys were doing, they were building they were building entertainment. I think what 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 my role in there was more of a translator to the traditional world. I think people didn't understand. I think that there was a, a stereotype around what gaming and what gamers uh, were doing. I think that there was preconceived notions about what it is that it seemed antisocial when it was actually the opposite. Like so many of the things were really different. And so it was, it was just kind of my proximity to what these guys had built and pioneered. And so I looked at my role as translating to the traditional world who didn't really understand it and testifying as to what I was seeing. And I think that, I, that my background gave me um, the, the credibility and the context to even explain it, to take sort of, you know, what, what I'd, I'd seen and lived in traditional entertainment and explain how, what, what this was. And, and I, actually, I actually think that, that Web3 is similar. I think that Web3 requires translation to people who are somehow resistant and they're resistant. You know, sometimes it's, it's your model is based on something, you know, and they're resistant to, to change. There was resistance to Web2 change for, for a lot of things. So I think that the parallels I see around kind of what, what I w was able to bring on the gaming side was, again, testifying to what's really happening in the space, not what a lot of, you know, opinions and, pre and preconceptions are, and then translating that to people to, to help accelerate the future. You know, basically of like, how do we get to that future state as quickly as possible? Right, that translation is so important, and we sometimes get a little bogged down by the terms of Web3, but remember, everything seems weird until it's not, right? When people are like, oh, I don't like this new stuff, I'm like, well, do you use Uber? And they're like, yeah, of course, every day. I'm like, well, remember when you said you wouldn't buy anything online? And not only did you buy a ride online, you got into a complete stranger's car or slept in a complete stranger's bed on Airbnb, right? All these things that were weird at first are everyday behaviors. So it takes adoption, but it takes tastemakers to help translate that. So I love how you helped bring gaming and entertainment. By the way, I want you guys to feel free to chime into each other. So if you want, just jump right in. I think one interesting point is that part of the translation means there's different meanings for different people. And you really think of gaming as entertainment, but not solely so, of course. But Kai, you really talk about entertainment, or sorry, gaming as social. And it absolutely is, right? Because the way we play games is much more social than we used to. But with phases like 500 million followers across all your different creators and channels, that's massive social. So talk to us a little bit about that perspective and how that's been able to bring gaming forward. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um there's just these new platforms, right? Like if you, I think if you think about gaming in, as a whole, you know, people think that it's just about entertainment, right? And, and really a lot of gamers are meeting each other in, in these spaces, right? So um, you're, you know, even the way that they're communicating as they're gaming, like in Discord, which, you know, has parallels to in the Web3 space as far as communication goes. But, you know, it's just, it's a whole new meeting ground. It's a whole new social experience. Um, and so you're seeing those things kind of, you know, come together and congeal. Um, and so, you know, now moving forward as Web3 kind of crosses over into, into gaming, John, what you're doing as far as like creating the user experience for people to be able to maneuver in between games and, and take their objects and, you know, and do it and do what they need to do with them. Um, you know, really understanding gaming as a social platform is important um, and not just, you know, a form of entertainment or like pa a, a passive pastime. Yeah. Um, I mean, social is career making nowadays and it didn't exist a couple decades ago i mean for context i used to be in corporate america i was the head of digital marketing at nike stumbled onto clubhouse during the pandemic and hit three million followers in a year that is now my career after a corporate life banks you've been creating content around your gaming forever i mean talk a little bit about how this new tool created a whole new world for us um well like i said i started in uh 2008, just on some super fun shit. Uh, this is long before. Nowadays, you tell, you talk to people about YouTubers and people on TikTok and making careers, and it's very well known, uh, widespread, that that's possible and that's a thing. It's a real thing. When I was doing it, this was not the case. Uh, my friends, my family, everybody under the sun told me that I was fucking insane for pursuing this. I dropped out of school to pursue this. Um, saw into the future and I, and I knew that there was something there. Made a video for fun on how to hack Xbox 360 gamer score, some stupid shit. 
and I found on a forum that didn't exist on YouTube and I put it on YouTube, made like 800 bucks and didn't look back. I just, this, I was like, this is something, this is a thing. And I kind of hid away in my bedroom and my parents didn't know what to think. My friends didn't know what to think. And I spent a lot of time on my computer and fast forward, you know, 12 years later and it's, it's a thing and it's crazy. It's, it's obviously the future gets bigger and bigger every year. Um, influencers or the new wave celebrity kids, you know, from 10 to even like 20 now are like, they fuck with us harder than they fuck with Leo and Toby and fucking, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Um, it's the future, obviously inter the internet. And I think the natural evolution of the internet is web three naturally. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what this is all about. How did you meet? How did you meet like some of the founders? Yeah, I mean, I met them on Xbox. I, best example, I tell the story all the time, and I think it's, I think it's awesome. We talked about the social, the social aspect of this whole thing. Um, Phase Apex, our co-founder, when I met him, he was 14 years old. Um, he's a devout Muslim, great kid. He has a wife, kids, doesn't swear, and I am the exact opposite of all of that. <laughs> um, but still, we found ourselves... As he was one of my best friends, and I had never met him face to face. I, we were friends for you know four or five years before we ever met in person, and um, it's it's only because we had the same ideas and the same vision and the same interest, and it's kind of, it's, I think it's a really beautiful thing. It's somebody who I would pass on the street and never look twice or even consider sitting down and talking to them or ever imagine that we could be friends, and now we're fucking family, and we built this incredible brand together and. Yeah, I think that's sorry. That's just that, I think that's where I learned the social aspect of the game was just understanding that story. Like to have a mark, you know, as visible as Phase Clan is in youth culture and internet culture, come from people that just met on Xbox, you know, for in, and didn't meet in real life for a year or two or three years is that's insane. That's even the music video, the music industry nowadays. It's like meta. Like these kids, these producers and and kids who are like creating these fucking banger hit songs have never met each other in real life and recording from front to back music videos and the producers and they're all spread out one could be in toronto one's in you know the bay one's in fucking florida and they're creating together and sitting on discord and that's how they're that's how they're you know producing and it's it's fucking i don't know it's cool just, just jumping in on the starting in 2008 when it wasn't a thing and it, and, and this is already a couple of years old where, you know, there, there, there was always this kind of poll that they do with kids about what do you want to do when you grow up. And a couple of years ago, I think it was like 2018 or 2019, where it was the first time that, you know, it used to be astronaut, teacher. For the first time, it was YouTuber, unseated all of those. And that like, and I think that that's what people don't, they don't understand. And, and especially, you know, traditional companies don't understand that this talent is the talent of the future, that, that all of this is going to remake the entertainment business based on kind of the point you were making about, yeah, they don't fuck with Leo as much as they fuck with Mr. Beast, right? Like, it's, not, it's a totally different stratosphere. We're a little, you know, older people like myself, we're a little kind of psychologically tied to the old ways, but the reality is, it's, and it's probably more than 20, it's 25 and under, maybe even starting to get to 30 and under, this, this new talent is what the entire entertainment business will rest on. I feel like Gen Z are criticized a lot for um, being lazy or not wanting to work or, um, you know, but I, I really feel like they're more intelligent than previous generations and that they've identified that systems just don't work for them and they want something outside of that. And um, they, they identify opportunities um, and, and develop their own systems to create things for themselves. And I think that that's very inspiring. And um, so I look to Gen Z a lot for inspiration on how I, uh, you know, how my own work is informed through, through that. So I think it's super inspiring. And it's because tools exist that never existed before. So Gen Z has different opportunities. They don't have to be beholden to big companies, patrons, like I'm, I'm, I obsess over the concept of patronage. And it's because there's tools and they don't need a big infrastructure to do it. There's a lot of tools. And so as a result, Gen Z, I think their Gen Z is misunderstood. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think that's, I think that's what's kind of cool about it too is that we've seen two massive changes in the gaming industry over the last 20 years that have been, had just lasting impact, right? The first was kind of free to play, which I know is not necessarily, you know, it's not some of the console PC titles, but like we went from 100 million gamers a month to 4 billion gamers. Half the world's population are playing games now because of free to play. So it increased this awareness. We had this explosion of gamers and population. The second one was content. So content could be UGC and Roblox and Minecraft. It could be Face Clan, it could be influencers. That had a massive, massive effect. So much content was being built, right? It turned everyone into stakeholders, right? And that's where I think we're heading next, which is really exciting. I think that's, to me, I, I mean, to be super honest, I don't really care about the technical details of NFTs or exchanges or things like that. What I care about is that this new generation is going to give a brand new business development platform for creation, right? Whether it's a Face Clan or it's somebody sitting in a different country that just has an idea. It allows people to be entrepreneurial in these massive online worlds that are consuming you know, a lot of our time. And I think that's the big transition that's about to happen. And I think it's gonna be bigger than we've ever seen in gaming in the past, right? And that that's gets really exciting. I feel like um, when we're talking about tools that as well people can utilize to, to really create from, um, that's where I see the opportunity with Web3, especially for gaming and content creators and, um, and streamers and all of that, I think that um, there are undeniable parallels between the communities that form around gamers and um, and content creators in traditional social media settings um, and what's happening in Web3. You know, we're all um, converging around this, this idea that we're all very passionate about that is the exact same thing that happens in gaming. And I feel like that is the direction and the opportunity for people. They can start to do that utilizing IP that they own rather than IP that other people eventually own. Um, Self-sovereignty and, um, you know, custodianship is, is the ethos of Web3 that I think that gaming will eventually adopt um, to their benefit. I see that this industry is one of the industries that will boom utilizing this technology. And while there's hurdles to adopt right now, I just, I really feel like it's a matter of um, a lack of context because we are so new, but like at Deadfellas, the focus really is to provide that context yep. for this um, through the tools that we're creating. So yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, it's an incredible time. You guys hit upon so many salient points that are changing in real time. We're flying this plane as we're building it. Um, Gen Z, you can't talk about the future without talking about the people in the future. And so listening to them and co-creating with them, I mean, Google is we looking at search by putting Gen Z on councils because they look at the world in a different way, right? Or even I, you guys talked about social, not as an audience. You guys talk about it as a community. That is a fundamental shift in mindset. Companies are like, how many followers? How much am I going to pay for that? No, like Gen Z wants to co-create. Gamers, creators, you're collaborating together. And if you don't get that, you're gonna be in for a hard time. And the great thing is while it's new, the technology that's starting to evolve is giving us opportunity to do that. So the attitude that you're talking about there, it's like a circular value exchange, right? And that's something that a lot of people um, in Web2 have a hard time understanding, especially brands and companies that come into the space. But I feel like gamers already know that and operate like that. Like the, there is a value of community that they understand um, and I'm sure you guys would, would agree with that. And it's, it's a real opportunity for them to, to take that to the next level. So I think that people that are creating content right now um, to adopt the technology that's being born from this space is, is just going to blow things up. Well, that being said, I mean, logically, strategically, step back and you're like, well, of course gaming makes sense for this future in technology. But in reality, I'm going to ask the hardcore gamers here, there's a distrust among the gaming community for this yeah. new technology, right? And it's not just the technology. I think there's a distrust about some of the game developers with downloadable content and always wanting more and more and more extracting from the players. That already exists. That's not a Web3 thing. But some of those, and I know you guys are proponents and visionaries. That's why you're here. But there's a lot of distrust. Where is that from and what can we do to help dispel that? It takes me back to the early days of when we were the, kind of the first guys who took the video game stuff seriously. And we, we would see backlash and, you know, um, just like, just general, generally just being trolled by like the rest of the community of like, you guys are taking this too seriously. You guys are like, 
money hungry, money whore was like the term back in the day. If, if you've been around for a minute, you've seen that on Twitter. Um, people didn't even like the idea of people making money at first, playing games or making videos or, or anything like that. And obviously that's changed now, that's celebrated. People fuck with that, it's like meta. Um, and I just, I think that that's where it's from. Again, this is a very like closed off community, just like anything else, just like music, fashion. Um, they're kind of gatekeeper-ish people who take it upon themselves to try to protect what we've built and created as far as a community. And I just think that's what it is. I think it just, it takes time. Um, we just gotta educate. Um, to kind of to kind of tie together what you guys were just talking about with the tools and the future, what the future looks like. Um, for anybody that's familiar with or watches Twitch streams, you're probably familiar with like Grand Theft Auto, role play, um, the servers and all that, that craziness, Aiden Ross, Kai Sinat, all those guys. Um, there are people who spend eight hours a day in Grand Theft Auto servers who work at fucking McDonald's in the game, right? And there, there are drug dealers and cops and hookers and it's Grand Theft Auto, you know what I mean? Um, but for me, that vision of like, there's such a, such a small uh, number of us who have been able to, with the tools we currently have, extract a career in money from what we're doing in the gaming realm. And I just, I see a future where if you're spending eight hours a day and you're good at something and you've developed all these skills that other people participate in, that sounds like, that sounds like a, a, an economy to me. That sounds like potential to build something on top of that, you know? And if you work at McDonald's and a Grand Theft Auto server, maybe you get paid for it in the future. And it all, you know, that's, yeah. That's I, think, I, I think from a high level, from a high level, that's, that's the conversation. You know what I mean? Like, there's so little tools to do anything here. And for the last 12, 15 years, gamers have made money ancillarily around other people's IP, right? So you gotta, you know, it's a user generated content world for the last 12 years, 13 years. And now the shift is to a user owned content world where you can, where you can own your own content too, not just the assets as far as collectibles and stuff like that. The next wave is the whole, you know, and you taught me this was the hole in the content. There's no content in this space, right? And so for content creators to understand that you can actually own the platforms and the content you're putting out to, to also support the rest of your business and your ecosystem that's, you know, maybe IRL, that's the future, right? Using the technology as the spine to your business and creating IP across all mediums. That's right. I think, I mean, I think it becomes the ultimate business development creator economy, right? It gives you those tools to where whether you're a big company and you're going to do something really complex, I'm going to have a brand tie-in and collab that ends up, you know, if I win that, I get to play banks. If I win, if I beat you, I get to take your item, right? That's one level, but it's also communities that are coming together, creating art that they're passionate about and being able to bring that entrepreneurially into these worlds. And I think that is going to be I, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. I think it's going to be the biggest shift we see, and it's going to be a big shift across the board, right? It's going to, it's going to, there's going to be a new balance of who can create and how do you get paid for that. I think there's going to be underserved communities in, in gaming right now that are actually going to be lifted out of this. I think groups like FaZe are going to dominate things because they, you know, you guys have the players. You have the content, you know. You don't own the, the game, but if you can have that suddenly opened up, to where you can create your version and create your opportunities within the game, it's going to be massive, right? Yeah. And we don't have those quite yet. We're starting to get there. We're starting to get the first few. And frankly, gamers are skeptical because the games kind of suck. I mean, to be real honest, if you build a game around an economy first, and it's like, cool, I can make money in this game. Okay. It, that feels like a job to me, right? But if you can suddenly have opportunities to where all your favorite brands are coming together and you can be entrepreneurial in your own way and contribute your own ideas and have your own contributions... That is awesome. And, and Banks, you were right, man. We've seen this so many times in gaming, right? With the YouTube content early on, mobile games. I mean, there's still today. And people are like, mobile games are not real games. That's shit, you know? 70% of the industry. It's over 100 billion a year in mobile now. And there's still people that are like, that's crap. That's, I'm skeptical of mobile games, right? But all of this contributes into a bigger, bigger ecosystem, a bigger industry. And I think we're, like I said, we're, we're in that next phase. There's like... Um it's like when you meet someone and, and you dislike them and you don't know why and then you find out actually you're very similar and best friends and, <laughs> you know, you can, when, when it's that situation, you're either 
arch nemesis or like best friends forever. And I feel like the parallels are so huge between um, gaming and content creation and, uh, and Web3 that, you know, once there is that realization, that click, there'll be no stopping it. I think that we do a lot of future casting in this space and it can sound a little bit um, fantastical sometimes, but if you are brave enough to, to really start building at this stage when things are super, um, you know, in the, in the, the beta stages, um, I think it will pay off in, in incredible amounts. Um, and I'm really excited for the future. The games are crap yeah, right now, they are. but they're not going to be. No, they're getting better. They're getting better. Yeah. Betty, you're one of my favorite cre like creators on the planet. Like, seriously, I, know, I haven't known you that long, but building from the outside in, shout out to Tarek, you taught me that, um, is, like, that's what this, the next wave is, is, like, people that are building IP and, and, and projects, thinking about the broader general community and their responsibility to be that bridge into certain spaces, that's the next, like, I think the first wave, the first hype cycle was just about how can everyone just be about themselves, make something that makes sense to them and something that makes sense to their pockets. And the next, the next move and the people that are going to really build the, the next generation for it, especially gaming, are people like you. Like, uh, the way you approach your project and, and, and Dead Fellas is so spot on and inspiring as far as, like, what I've been able to learn in the gaming space. I think you're one of the only people that's, like, really, really doing yeah. it that way, you know? Thank you. We, we need success stories to change people's minds around it, right? Like if you're talking about like back in the in the in the days of, of phase when the community was actually against some of the change, that's not uncommon. Passionate communities tend to resist change. Like I'll tell you from I come from the music business, and every single band that goes from a baby band to a to an arena band has the challenges of some of their original people, they're mad. Same thing happened with FaZe. Same thing is going to happen here. And also, look, we've unfortunately been let down by some people within the community, so that's even had a further chilling effect. But that dynamic of saying, no, we like it the way it is, is common, and we just need to show a success story that makes people go, oh, wait a second, this is different. This actually can have benefit. This is something interesting and exciting, and that'll, that'll be the tip of the spear. That's where we started to see the shift in tone from... You guys are taking this too serious. This is fucking not a thing. Like, we're just playing games. Is when Tommy and I moved in together and started showing ourselves in the real world. And um, Tommy and I are not the stereotype. The fans hate it. Yeah. When, when you put the camera on yourselves, the fans were not with at, it in the, at in first, the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the beginning. In the beginning. But then we started flying around the country and doing cool shit and showing people that you don't have to. Well, again, when I first started playing video games, I kept it a secret. This wasn't something that I was proud to announce to my friends or anybody else. I'm a gamer. I play video games all day. It was like fucking, you know what I mean? No. Um, but we gave, we kind of, I, I feel like FaZe's secret sauce in the beginning was we gave these kids like a, someone to look at and say, wow, these guys are fucking doing it. They're living together. They're flying around. They're partying and playing games and doing weird shit and living life and they're not, you know, weird, introverted, gamer-esque kids. Um, it redefined a gamer lifestyle. It, ac it actually redefined what that, it broke that stereotype for the community first, and then took time. That's where we saw the shift in tone from, like, you guys are taking it too serious to, this is something everybody, we want to do this too. You know what I mean? To go back to your point about um, the money that you were talking about and, like, the resistance to that initially, I feel like... Um, that is something that is a hurdle because the, the NFT space especially is um, looked at through those same, um, you know, lenses where people think that that is all it is. Um, but truly, if you look deeper, um, there is true, true culture being um, built from this. It's undeniable. Um, and so, again, when that is realized on a large scale, I think there's no stopping it. It's just a matter of education and... Um, people like FaZe um, can you, continuing to push in that space. And I feel like, you know, when we talk about the status quo, um, it's comfortable. It's comfortable. And when you come out with ideas that are disruptive or, you know, challenge that in any way, people get mad. But to me, that kind of is an indicator that you're doing something right. Um, otherwise, you're not really bringing anything new or innovating at all, right? Retweet. 
I was, I was just going to say, too, I, I think that su the success has to – we're making steps towards that, but we're not there yet, right? I mean, we, our game, we have a game, Blanco's. It has over a million accounts, right? A lot of people are, like, celebrating that. Like, we got a million. I'm like, dude, that's barely getting started. Like, we really have to get to 50 million to 100 million to really make change. But I feel like we are getting there, right? And a lot of walls are coming down, which is really important, right? The game's on Epic Game Store now. We're starting to work with a lot of brands. I mean, there's a lot of great things happening, and, and it's a lot of nice successes, but there, we, there's no home run yet. Yeah, there's no grand slam yet, and, and, but I think it's coming very, very quickly. Well, I appreciate that restraint because this is a methodical, slow build. We have to figure out the technology and how to translate it. So I respect that. But if you just look at the economics, right, because I'm hearing, here's certain criticisms of the gaming industry. Here's what some of the technology in the new world can do, and it's actually matching up. We just don't have the linchpins yet. But just look at some economics, because gamers, right, when you create content and play, you're beholden to both the games you play, the developers, and the platforms that you broadcast content on. So you have two bosses that you have zero control over. In the new world, if you were to sell 50 NFTs, like let's say a digital collectible or a membership pass or a fan pass to a gamer, 50 people being your fan at 0.1 Ethereum makes more than 1 million streams of your song on Spotify. 1 million, and all you need is 50 fans. And on YouTube, it's even less. You just need 25 fans to be in your corner. So I don't like calling people micro-influencers because I think that belittles the effort. They put as much effort in as the big-time ones. But the ability, like you guys, or thanks, you were just saying, like, to have a side gig, you could work at McDonald's and play games on the side. You can make music, create content, until it becomes your main gig. This technology is giving us the chance to do that. Is, yeah. And the economics work. So we're on this cusp of trying to figure this out. But the coolest thing is that it's not just the builders on stage building this future. It's all of us. If you selected to be in this room, you are co-creating. Yeah. So in the end, I want to ask you guys for a final thought. And you get one sentence. What do you hope for the future of gaming, communities, and creators? Any order you want. I'll go. Um, so I want a future where creators are truly self-sovereign over their own content um, and are empowered regardless of their situation, um, you know, socioeconomically or otherwise. I feel like Web3 especially provides opportunity for marginalized communities to be uplifted through their own efforts rather than constantly having to um, look to, to systems that don't serve them um, to pull them out of a, a situation that was literally created. Um, so that's that's what I hope to see. Yeah. Um, I, I can go. I, um, I mean, I, I'd love to get away from this industry is very focused on get rich quick, flipping assets, things like that. And I think we have to get away from that and we have to get into 100% focus on innovation, collaboration, creators. And I think as, as, as we do that, the true innovation is going to come. And, and it's less about floors and wind moon and all, all these things that people talk about, especially in like the Twitter space. Like we, we just got to get away from that and into true innovation and true brand collaboration. And that that's a, will change things. Um, you know, my, my hope through, through Web3 tools is there's the new renaissance period. There's a new renaissance period where you have more artists that are able to support themselves making their own art and maybe that's you know making just enough the same amount of money as their other you know kind of job but they're happier and if we have more artists doing that invariably we're going to have people that stand out and break through i think on the same side on kind of using the tools to be entrepreneurs and to be innovators you're also going to have a way to connect and to to build ideas via these tools without needing a patron who tells you how to do it, that invariably, again, we're going to have different expressions of that. And so I think uh, there's a, a true ability to have renaissance in both art and renaissance in innovation based on these tools. What I hope to see for the future of gaming and community, um, the fact of the matter is not everyone is a creator, not everyone is a YouTuber, Twitch streamer. Um, I hope to see a world where if you spend, you know, eight hours a day on your favorite game, there's a place for you in that economy and in that market to uh, build a life for yourself yep. and a career for yourself. And I believe 100% in my heart of hearts that that is the future. I, yep. I do believe it. Um, 
yeah, I think that crypto gaming is going to be the biggest consumer market on planet Earth. I think it's going to dwarf industries, even like music, traditional entertainment, uh, modern day gaming. I think it's going to be the biggest of all time. I think that there's a lot of a lot ahead in terms of uh, where people fit into that whole the grand scheme of that beyond just being a YouTuber or a, a Twitch streamer. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I want, what do I want? I want support and enhancement and elevation. Um, and when I mean that, I want, I want the relationship between, um, you know, gatekeepers of resources to be different and change and, and, and be healthier with creators. Um, it's not a healthy relationship, the, you know, gatekeepers and people that understand business on another level, you know, in a more traditional form um, and money and finance need to form a, a new relationship with talent and, and creators. Um, and it's been a long time coming. So. Well, I love that future you paint. In closing, I'm going to share one quick anecdote, anecdote for uh, people who are nervous about the future. I was at South By this year and went to a memorial dinner for Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos who passed away during the pandemic. And I sat next to a lovely gentleman named Phil, kind of a boomer in turquoise clothes. And it was a lovely evening talking about leadership and values. So the next day, in contrast, we're at Sandbox's party, a metaverse company and Paris Hilton's DJing, neon colors, loud music. And I see Phil walk in, in his, you know, Miami Vice turquoise colors with his boomer friends. So I walk, I'm like, hey, Phil, um, what are you doing here? He goes, Swan, are you involved in all this? And you know, that's what like people do, with, like boomers that don't understand technology, right? And I was like, well, Phil, a, a metaverse is a virtual world where you know people interact with characters and other things, and an avatar is a digital representation of yourself. And I'm mansplaining what a metaverse is. And Phil puts his hand on my shoulder, and he's like, Swan, I'm the creator of Second Life. <laughs> so <laughs> as I take my foot out of my mouth. It just made me realize that the distinctions we make about future, metaverse, NFTs, gaming, those are just technical terms. We don't, when I ask you what music you like, you don't say an MP3, you say jazz or rock. And we're not gonna say NFT or any of this stuff. It'll just be the stuff we love built on culture and community. And we're just so excited about the future of what this technology can do for us. So with that guys, please give a massive hand to this incredible panel. Thank you. Future of gaming, everyone.